Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Today we have episode 40, Pixel Art and Embroidery, a study in stitch angles. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Uh, <laughs> looks like my green screen got displaced. There we go, folks. <laughs> it's been a day of rushing around and getting things done, and I am happy to have you here as we talk about some fun stuff. I'll say ahead of time, happy Halloween. I know it's a little bit different than most Halloweens have been for folks, and I know that that's a hard time, but I'd like for us to have as much fun as we can and allow ourselves to get a little out of our usual comfort zones, which is what Halloween is all about, being a little different and doing things a little differently. But I'm happy to have you guys here for a little discussion about pixel art and some stuff surrounding pixel art. You may have noticed on the on the initial screen here that you see, yes, there's some pixel art here, but there's also a patch here from Habitica. There's also a little piece of a QR code in the background. Well, there's gonna be some stuff we're gonna talk about that is surrounding pixel art, that is pixel art adjacent as we get through this. So let's go ahead and start with some comments. We got some people who just showed up and I love to have you guys in here. Jeff Fuller of Embroidery Nerd and doing his own great stuff. I made it. I'm glad you made it in and it's going to be fantastic. Uh, like I said, some cool stuff going on. We're going to show you some stuff in software. We'll talk about pixel art. We'll talk about pixels and retro art. And this is supposed to be fun. A lot of people are already getting ready for whatever they're doing for Halloween at home. And I'd like to just have this be a fun episode, but I'm glad you made it in. Uh, Christine Shreve, who, by the way, doing her own Women in Business podcast, really great stuff going on there. Go check out her podcast. Says, good afternoon, Eric. Happy Halloween Eve. Thank you very much. And hello, Christine. Letty Elizabeth Walker says, good afternoon. Uh, Mike Muldani says, konnichiwa. I probably uh, butchered that, but maybe we both did. I don't know. <laughs> so konnichiwa, Mike. Good to have you in here. And the guy who named the reciprocators, the steady fans of the take-up, as we know, take-ups, as we can see, actually above this shoulder, uh, we can see the take-up levers on a machine named after a part of the machine. Well, having all the fans named after the reciprocator, both because you give and take and you give things back and because uh, the reciprocator is part of the machine that's very, very important, which you'll know if you've ever nailed a hoop and broken your reciprocator. Uh, really cool to have you guys there. And uh, Maureen says, leaving the song, but running out to pick up dinner. Hey, grab dinner. That's cool. Everybody's got to eat. You can run out. <laughs> By the way, you throw it on YouTube, especially if you have premium, you can just stream it on your phone as you go around. It won't be as graphical, but hey, it's still good. I know I do a lot of that. Uh, Christine says, 12 more episodes and you'll have a year's worth. Yeah. And amazingly, I haven't stopped talking yet, have I, folks? Uh, <laughs> we'll have to do something special 12 more episodes down the road. I'm not sure what, but we'll have to do something for sure for all the reciprocators out there. Uh, Frank Dunn coming in from across the pond. Good evening, all. Well, good evening to you, Frank. Thank you for coming in and for sharing the post as usual. And uh, Justin did say in his own right. Justin Armento says, hello. Hello, Justin. Hello to Sean as well. Just managed to make friends with you shortly, Sean. I know you got tuned into the uh, stuff from Shirt Lab. If you guys didn't know, the Shirt Lab event that just went on, I, I did a piece on e-commerce. So we may, I may be, uh, you know, persuaded to do some more e-commerce on this show as well. If you guys want to hear more about the everyday e-commerce piece that I did there, and uh, we can talk about the different kinds of stuff that I have done in e-commerce over my career as well. And Justin says again, uh, happy Halloween Eve. And John says, hi, Eric. Amazing how much you give back to us. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, I like to think that as Mike so adeptly put, that we are reciprocators here, that the people who are here are the kind of people who take and give back equally and who are uh, willing to reciprocate when they're giving back stuff. So if you pay it forward, teach somebody else and teach from where you are, absolutely. Uh, that is something to learn. So everybody here, and this is an aside and something I may actually do an entire episode at some point. Uh, I would love to encourage you all to teach where you are. I know I've said it on the podcast before, but if there's something that you're going through right now, even if there's someone who is just one day newer at this than you are, they might not be going through your situation and be very interested in how you're handling it. So teach from where you are, pay it forward and reciprocate folks. When people give, give back. It's always good. And uh, <laughs> here goes Christine. I did my podcast this week without a guest. Uh, carrying the whole show yourself is tough. Um, you know, it can be. It can be tough. Sometimes I worry about carrying the show, but you know what I really like to do is let the embroidery speak for itself. I really do love this stuff and I don't get to do quite as much as I used to or as, as much as I would want to because I, I sometimes don't always get time to do all the experimentation that I would like to do or used to do uh, when I was uh, young and up crazy nights doing that stuff. Now it's a lot of products and working on software and stuff like that. As you guys know, I'm in the Embrilliance headquarters. Sometimes we have products and stuff that have to go out the door. Of course, we work on that stuff 
But the cool thing is, because we're developing new tools, I do get to do a little development, stuff like that. And I can let that speak for itself. And I'll also say, I, I, earlier I talked about how you should teach from where you are. Well, learning is greatly enhanced by teaching and experimenting. And I will say that the pixel art thing that I came up with, and I'll, I'll go ahead and bring this up here shortly, the entire pixel art work that I did, it, it started out because somebody asked me, hey, can you do pixel art embroidery? And though I had not really worked on it, I had done some things that are around it, and I'm actually gonna show you guys some of that stuff. I had not done the kind of style that we're talking about today. And so in order to teach it properly, I said, hey, you know what? I absolutely need to go ahead and um, bring in, you know, you have to go ahead and bring in that physical knowledge. It's like I was talking about, you guys know that I studied in Iceland for a little while. And one of my favorite things that they say in Iceland is somebody, uh, when you really understand something, you understand it below your lower jaw. And what that means to them is instead of just thinking about it and being cerebral about it, you do it, you experience it, it is part of you. And that's something that I think is really important. So knowing things below your lower jaw sometimes requires us to uh, get in, experiment and teach and teaching someone else will help you to refine your own opinions, refine what you're doing. In fact, I said the same thing this morning. If you guys watch the Two Regular Guys podcast, uh, we had Michelle Moxley on talking about um, digital hybrid printing, cool stuff like that was going on. But at the end of it, we did this little thing called It's Five Things where we really ask people to submit you know, five things that they think are important or five things to teach. And one of the things we didn't have one this week. And so I came up with five reasons to submit five reasons you want might want to teach. And one of them is that in trying to formulate something to be taught in trying to show someone else what you what they want to do or what you want to show them, you will refine your own position on something, you'll find holes in beliefs that you have, like, let's say you believe something works a certain way, but you don't know if it's true or why and you test it and find out maybe it's not the case. And so teaching really can help you learn. So I may do a, a podcast on that later. I may do another episode where we discuss that. Um, and certainly if you guys are into things like um, discussing motivation, discussing artistic style and creativity, discussing stuff like that, I can do some episodes on that as well. It's something I've written about before. And I would say talking about that, talking about teaching, learning, talking about the way we absorb information and how to get things up. Uh, into your head and processed as inspiration is certainly something that I can put together. And I'll go ahead and bring in a couple more comments before I get into this. Um, Christine says, uh, maybe more tough for me as I talk more about personal stuff. Yeah, that's always hard. That's definitely always hard. If you have a chronic illness, mental or physical, you should go watch. Uh, small plug, so I'm proud of the show. You know, I, I wish I hadn't missed that one because I really wanted to see that. Uh, if you're living with chronic illness yourself or living with someone who does, uh, it's like another person in the room and it really can be very difficult to get things done because it's like uh, you show up already at a deficit for anything you want to do. So anybody who's suffering with chronic illness right now, my heart goes out to you. And I would say, you know, from all of us who have any sort of chronic problem, um, yeah, it's it's hard because you show up and you already have to dig out from the thing that you are, you're already underneath before you start. Uh, we have a couple more highs before we get going. Uh, Julie Nelson, hi Eric, Jules from Wisconsin. Dang, it's cold here. I believe it. I've got family up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and it is gets quite cold there. We actually went sub zero, or we went close to sub freezing at least, not sub zero. We went sub freezing for a while, and we had a big cold snap. It was 19 degrees, many many inches of snow. People don't know though. I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I live up in the foothills. We're very high up, high altitude, and we get cold. We can get real cold, and we got real snow. But the funny thing is, once again, because it's New Mexico, sun's back out and it melted off, but we had three days of being under entire uh, storm warnings and snow. Pretty crazy stuff. And Cindy King out of Texas says, hi, happy Education Friday. Nobody said it, so I'm going to say it. Happy Education Friday to you, Cindy. I've seen you around because actually I listened to some of the other podcasts while I was working this morning. And uh, Education Friday is in full effect. People are out and learning. All right, with that, guys, let's get into the actual meat of the show. Let's talk about pixel art, right? Let's talk about pixel art. So before we get fully into pixel art, certainly I do want to show you some stuff. We're going to go ahead and I'll add this to the stream. This is one of the uh, articles that people may see from me. This is kind of more of the home and art focused version. I've also done this for Images Magazine out in the UK. If you haven't seen that, I've done a couple of different pieces based on the learning I did trying to do pixel art. And this is the first one from Ghost and Embroidery Machine. And this is really what spurred all of it. Before we get into more of the technical stuff, this is how this all started. Uh, and how it started essentially was this, uh, that someone originally asked me, hey, can you make that pixel art style embroidery that I'm seeing for all these retro games? Now, I'm going to fully admit that I was a video game player when I was a kid, I was a gamer. I really did immerse myself in the kind of 8 and 16-bit 
era. So that is something I know very well. I have definitely spent a lot of time messing around with uh, retro consoles and stuff, even after the fact. Now, certainly I don't get as much time to play as I would like to now, uh, but this is something I know very well. And this is where it all started was somebody said, I've got a couple commercial examples of these things that I want to do. And I want to make this kind of art myself, but I don't really get it. I don't know what's going on here. And of course, here is a tiny Mario, as we can see. And this is done as a dad hat. And what I'm actually going to say later on, we're going to talk about the size of art and the size of pixels. I actually think that the really, really small ones aren't as effective um, because I think that you end up with less of that texture. But you can see how we've got some directional texture here that's really influenced by stitch angle. And it's changing how the light and dark, uh, the shadow and the shine are affecting how that piece looks. And it really is calling out the nature of the art as pixels, as individual squares. Uh, but what we're going to say see is like this is one of the larger renditions. I think it's way more effective in larger sizes. This particular one is done on 3D foam, um, but 3D is not necessary for this. And the pieces I did did not have 3D. The real kicker on this piece, the real thing that makes these stand out, is the stitch angle that creates this kind of light and dark pattern. This very, uh, if you were looking at this in any other fashion, you'd almost think of it as a basket weave pattern. It really is the stitch angle changes that make this happen because what we're seeing here is a very limited color palette, which is true to the original colors that you would have seen on the video game. So like I said, a lot of this pixel art stuff is coming out of a video game place. It's coming out of retro gaming. It's coming out of, this is the 8-bit era with the N Nintendo. Uh, I also saw another piece, which I'll show you real briefly here, that was from the 16-bit era. And this is the one that a lot of people really get excited about. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog's face here, more detailed. The 16-bit era had these larger sprites for sure. A sprite is a an image in a retro game. Like the characters are often sprites. I'm not going to get detailed, super detailed into sprites, but no, if I say sprite, that is a video game character image. And uh, Sonic is much larger than old school Mario was. So we're going to talk about that again in a second, but this is one of the things that people get excited about. This is where this all kind of comes from. And now I would say these are a little less popular than they were when they first kicked off, but there was a period of time where Tons of retro gaming properties were being sold in retail spaces this way. And I and you even saw brands getting into it where uh, I saw several pieces like uh, Coca-Cola had pieces out where they had a small uh, icon like Coca-Cola cup with the logo that was done in really low resolution pixel art and then rendered in this textural method. Thing is, it's really not that deep difficult or detailed to handle. It's really just about dealing with the inherent nature of problems that you'll have with satin stitches and with doing all these angle changes. But we're gonna talk about that technicality a little later. I wanna go back, I'm gonna bring this back to some original ways that I got into pixel art earlier because I actually kind of went through my own uh, experiences with doing art that's like pixel art previously. And first, I'm just gonna say, since we're talking about Halloween and we're having a little bit of fun, Here's one of the things to prove that yes, I uh, have pixel art in my blood that I have <laughs> certainly thought about pixel art before. Uh, and this is one of the pumpkins. I used to do the pumpkin carving contest at Black Duck at the place that I used to work uh, for doing in-house digitizing embroidery and e-commerce. And that's the pixel art pumpkin. And you can see I've actually peeled away some of the skin on the pumpkin so that I've got these glowing kind of after effects like a, a scan on an actual uh, video game. The cool thing about it is also, uh, you can see even in the light, it looks pretty cool. This is what it actually looks like in the light. And yes, I have black cats. And this is Atli, who's named after, since you guys all have seen the Viking Age episode, I'm sure you guys know a medievalist. Atli is named after kind of the Norse name in the sagas of Attila the Hun. But yeah, so Attila the Hun via a Scandinavian literary resource. So you're in Eric's world today again. <laughs> Sorry, kids. But here we are. That's Atli, the, the black cat, and he loves the pixel pumpkin and was trying to eat it. But there we are. Happy Halloween, everybody. Here's your pixel art. <laughs> pixel art skull face on your pumpkin. But let's go from there to actually talk about something else. My original uh, attempt at doing kind of pixel art, first time I did it was using cross stitch. If you guys really haven't thought about how cross stitch looks, it's like I almost want to pull this up. This is like an exemplar from the 1800s. So we're talking about a monogram example pattern from the 1800s. I believe, or this one, I believe this was the 1800s, but like 1800s to 1920s, I had a, a bunch of different exemplars at first, and these samples were very much similar. They did looked about the same. Essentially, late 1800s, they had these these grids, they are grid based, they have grid lines, they look like any pixel art you would see today, of course, because they're made out of these individual blocks. So counted stitch work, to me, was my first kind of exposure to the idea of, hey, I could actually take 
pixel art, something I was familiar with. So when I started doing uh, graphics of any kind, the first time I did graphics, um, I was drawing things pixel by pixel, 256 colors, uh, you know, on old school hardware. We're talking about old DOS-based computers. We're talking about Commodore and Amiga, stuff like that. I was drawing with the early mouse, you know, early pointers, 256 colors and less and drawing these kind of things myself. And this is very similar to what you would see for that kind of art style. So looking at that, I thought, hey, you know, one of the ways we can attach or attack this thing is by doing art like, like that, you know, for, like this cross stitch art, right? And so this initial piece was actually an art piece that I did that mixed the two. You'll see that I was already thinking about QR codes. This was done for a gallery show. I'm actually gonna go ahead and bring this up larger again and kind of show it to you. It looks, it's not as perhaps as, uh, <laughs> it, it looks like it might be something that looks a little um, dicey, a little weird. It's actually from, once again, a very early vintage American sampler that was of the, it was kind of like the Garden of Eden. It showed uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with the serpent. And here's the thing. This is the age when QR codes first came around and were interesting. I went ahead and put together this QR code, which I believe still functions on this one. Um, and this one was done in a really early kind of cross stitch software. So it's got some different stitch type styles, depending on the software you're using, you can either use a cross stitch fill and kind of gate it, or they might have some clickable cross stitches. This one had some full and half and different stitches in it. Um, this particular piece, that QR code there, it says citation needed under here. And this border was originally the decoration that was on Wikipedia. And it was a the decoration that looked like little books that was running on all the pages on Wikipedia. It doesn't exist anymore. That style has long been dropped. But citation needed in that blue was very much looked like the citation needed link from Wikipedia. And what you're going to find is this QR code, if you scan it, goes to uh, a, a Wikipedia page on the, the tree of good and evil. So, <laughs> so yes, here we are. This is how I am. And it, it, I don't know if it still runs. I, actually, we have some verification. Mike says, yep, links to Wikipedia. Yeah, you can scan it on screen as you are. And it does scan correctly in person as well. That was my first exposure to kind of try and do pixel art was using counted cross stitch to do that. And as you can see the little apple with the bite out of it, referencing the Apple uh, logo computers, Apple computers logo. Uh, obviously this was tongue in cheek and meant to be funny that good and evil or that knowledge was something that we are now delivering via QR codes. And this very circuit like tree pattern was done custom, but the rest of it, the actual, these uh, examples here of Adam and Eve were done from a really early Americana sampler. So we're talking about, you know, colonial America kind of, uh, kind of sampler era. So this is, that's what we were actually looking at. And that's this here, right? That's the same picture that's here. That was my early idea of that. And why did I go with that? Is because what a pixel really is, right? Let's define pixels and we'll get into, like I said, we're going to get deeper into the pixel art and into the kind of look that we're, we're getting into that I showed you earlier very shortly. But let's define pixels really briefly just to kind of give you guys an idea what we're talking about, right? Uh, a pixel is originally, it was in the 60s this was named, it was a picture element, a pixel. And this is just a square, generally, and the way we're doing it here, it's square. They don't have to be square. These are individual points, generally on a screen, that are going to make up an entire image. And in our essence here, we were looking at square pixels. Now that's not always how they displayed and especially not on old school tube TVs, they didn't display as squares, they're more rectangular. But the way we understand pixels in pixel art now and in our resolution on monitors now is with square pixels. So that's really where we got into it. When I knew I had square pixels, I thought counted cross stitch is a really easy way to get into it. But even at this point, I already thought, you know, Yes, it's cool. Cross stitch is cool. And here's actually the sample that uh, came from that piece that I showed you earlier. This is the actual patch that I made after the fact. It was a felt patch that I did. And uh, this piece turned out pretty well. I liked how it looked. But here's the thing. Pixel art looks kind of great like that, but it really is a combination of styles then. It does harken back to what cross stitch means to people. Certainly cross stitch, if you look at mrxstitch.com, you can do really cool stuff with cross stitch, but cross stitch does look like handwork. It looks like Americana, it looks vintage, it looks uh, like craft. And maybe that's not what we're looking for. Maybe when we're saying we want pixel art, I don't want cross stitch, I want something solid, I want it shiny, I want it to reflect the kind of video game art I'm thinking about. So starting out with that, I was like, all right, maybe that's not the way we do it. it was cool at the time, liked it. Just scanning the QR codes was a really cool thing. And actually I, I went on with that as well. But cross stitch is maybe not the best way to roll with that, right? And then, you know, we see more examples like this. And we're gonna talk about this as well, where people say, okay, yes, they've done something that is cross, that is, you know, 
not cross stitch and it's pixel like, but if you look at this piece up close, um, that piece is done in fills and essentially it loses the sense of the pixel. Now, certainly the truth of the matter is there is no texture in original pixel art. This is more what original pixel art looked like. It only had solid colors. There's nothing that makes those pixels stand out. The thing is that that may not be enough for us to really call out. We're trying to say this thing is made of squares and that's what's interesting about it, right? We're trying to reference this old school like video game aesthetic. And part of it is it being low resolution, but the other part is calling out the pixels. So a piece like this was also not quite it either. And that's the thing is essentially when we're looking at all these pieces, right? <laughs> I've got some other pieces up here. Sorry about that, folks. Um, looks like I lost my pit tab. Suffice it to say this piece here, we'll go back here. Um, this essentially doesn't quite do it. In fact, I can go ahead and show you this. We're going to go ahead and pop up another tab. We're going to drop this out. We're going to share something else here real quick. And let's see if we can just go ahead and share in software one of the other things that I originally had done, right? We, I was tasked to do some pixel art and this is much earlier, this is before all this stuff kind of came out. Everybody said, okay, let's do this pixel art, but I want something that's a little more solid. And I personally said, I wanna show some sort of semblance of this being more than just big flat planes of color. Now I found out later there's a copy or, you know, copyright character that's something that I wouldn't do again. Um, originally when I did this, I did not know this was a Final Fantasy sprite. I thought this was something original. Turns out it isn't. But what you can see is I'm already starting to develop a difference here, right? Um, what you might have seen previously, and we can go ahead and bring this up. We had this piece right here that doesn't really have any texture. And I actually found another example that somebody had sent me where they wanted to do a pixel heart. The pixel heart is fine, but if you look at it, Yes, we've got the edges. We can tell that it's made of squares, but from a distance, especially at small sizes, you're gonna notice that all we really have are the edges of it to show that it's made of pixels. And this is just a standard fill. And I thought something was lacking there. So when I was actually tasked to do this piece, I started to try and experiment with how I'm gonna get some texture in there. And what you can see is in the hat here, in the hands especially, these fingers are made of individual bars of satin stitch. So I'll go ahead and I can scrub through this to play it for you. I still did the most of it with Phil. And in this bordered piece, it didn't look awful, but you know, I looked at it again and said, all right, I've got these with Phil and that's not bad, but I started doing more of this. You'll see that I did satin bars. And the satin bars in the hat brought that brim to the forefront that brought it for further forward in the picture plane because it's layered on top of the stuff in the background. And then again, I used fills here, but then in the brim, I used the bars of satin stitch to bring it forward. And I thought, you know, that's a little bit of texture and it certainly helped. Um, we have the same thing in the bottom here to define the edge under the face. And then all of the outline here was done in, in that same kind of style. And you can see the hands are made out of three different pieces of satin stitch. And my idea there is that I wanna be able to see fingers. I wanna see fingers pointing. I wanna see a hand with a finger and a thumb. And that little piece of texture, those overlaps give you the texture of the finger and the thumb, right? So that gave me a little bit of texture. And I was kind of happy with that. It looked all right, right? This is not a bad piece. You can see that I've got this style essentially working out that way. And in the end, I went ahead with just a standard border on it. And so this is what a lot of things end up at. They're not quite that fully filled look where it's just a fill and there's nothing else to it. There's no texture, but they're not quite that pixel texture that we were showing you later that looks kind of very mosaic, very basket weave. So this is kind of an intermediate step for me. And I thought, you know, that's pretty good. I don't mind that piece at all. It doesn't look bad. And I would say that it's not the end of the world as far as could you make pixel art looks like this and that's pretty cool. Yes, it's not the style of that commercial hat that everybody got really excited about when it came out. So for that particular piece, I thought, you know, it's not bad, not very unhappy with that. I'm certainly okay with how that turned out. Um, and it's better in my opinion than this. I'm not very fond of it just being completely flat. Completely flat look is not what I'm looking for when we're talking about the pixels, especially, like I said, you're comparing it with this and the kind of detail we have in here, this texture, this shine, this shadow, uh, it is really interesting. It does though break up the picture a little bit. It doesn't look as solid as it could. And I would say, uh, especially when we're talking about the Nintendo color spectrum that people are using, it can sometimes be a little confusing to the eye depending on how uh, deep the colors are. But that other kind of method, the method by which I was doing essentially that, uh, you know, that kind of a little bit of both, a little bit of fill, a little bit of satin. It was kind of in that same vein, right? Certainly here we've got those. I think this is too hollow. Those don't look quite right. This is also what informed later on my work with QR codes. Uh, 
I ended up doing QR code pieces and I found that the uh, cross stitches didn't always scan very well. I went to do QR code pieces, which is another kind of pixel art. If you don't know what a QR code is, quick response code, it was actually really big in Japan and we had an original flowering of it that didn't really take off. And now because it's built into cameras where you don't have to have a special QR code reader app, it's much more common again. And funny enough, because of uh, what's happened with the pandemic, we ended up where people are using QR codes a lot for menus. They're using them for things so that you don't have to touch anything but your phone. And so now there's been another round of QR codes. And this is something I used to wear around to the shows early on in my career. And this was, it's a dead link. So if you try and get to it, it's a dead link. Unfortunately, I have to make a new one. This was a shortened link to my LinkedIn profile. So if you scanned my arm as I was walking by, you would get my LinkedIn profile in history and you'd find out who I was and <laughs> what was going on with me. The thing is I used that same overlapped satin technique so that I had something not only textured, but I was controlling the size of the dots. And the thing, the reason I bring this up is that this was starting to get me to a point where I was controlling my satin stitches to make square dots, right? But the difference here is there's not a basket weave kind of look. And I can actually bring this up also on screen. I'm gonna go ahead and go back over to software. And we're gonna take a look at this. We're gonna zoom this in here. This is a new version. This should be scannable now but this is a new shortened version of the QR code. And if you look at this once again, I'll go ahead and run scrub through it. Certainly we have our border now. I would have done that uh, after, but this is actually not a finished version. What you're going to see is aside from these markers in the corners and those are done in a fill stitch in the corner, um, the rest of this is satins and you'll see that it's overlapping satins and I'm traveling between them uh, going by the corners, just doing little travel stitches. Also, I left untrimmed aside from the corner uh, markers because QR codes are a little bit tolerant of damage to the QR code. And so you don't have to worry quite so much about having little bitty trims in between them. So this is another version of it. And what you can see is everywhere that I have a space that another bar is going to be next to it, I've got a little tab and it goes underneath where the next pixel will be. And as you see, it looks very uneven. Those gaps don't look square. They look very squat and wide. Why is that? Pull compensation, right? Pull compensation in the width. It, we know that those satin stitches are gonna get shorter, right? They're gonna get shorter. They're going to get taller, right? They're gonna get, uh, the, the stitches will get shorter. So these columns will get thinner. The columns will get taller as the stitches stack up. And so as you see these pieces there, Right here in the center, we've got this piece that looks very much like it is not square. This will become square in the running. Learning this for QR codes is what gave me kind of the knowledge I needed to know, or at least the practice, when I was going to use the same kind of techniques when we get to pixel art, right? But let's go ahead and look at this one more time. We'll watch it run, and you can see that I'm already, I'm traveling between the corners. I'm overlapping things deeply because the other thing with QR codes, I don't want there to be extra gaps that don't need to be there. Now QR codes can, like I said, they are tolerant of faults. And you'll see that extreme kind of compensation because I'm really careful. And at this very small size, of course, compensation is going to look more extreme at smaller sizes because as we know that compensation is pretty regular. It's not like it changes too, too much with scale, not enough that when you get really small, it actually looks extreme because you have a lot of push compensation that you're dealing with. You're shortening up your vertical columns here quite a lot to get them to get to the way they should on, on screen. So that they, when they grow, that they grow to the size they should. But you can see that I've got these overlaps and I'm very careful about my pathing because I don't really care to do any trimming on this. And like I said, I'm leaving the trims in place aside from the corners. And aside from the major trims from the corner uh, identifiers that show the orientation of the code to the computer, um, everything else is being left alone. So you can see how I'm traveling between those corners and you can see that I am overlapping so that I don't get any breaks. So let's go ahead and run through the rest of it until we get to the final corners and the corners, of course, jump across. But there's the QR code. And a QR code, once again, that is essentially that is on and off. That doesn't have any colors. Either there's a dot there or there is not a dot there, but it is still something that is a raster. We'll go ahead and define that too. If you ever heard somebody talk about raster graphics versus vector graphics, right? Well, vector graphics, we have these lines that you can scale and they grow in scale and they're defined by the relationship between the points and the curves, right? So those that's how those work. But what's raster? Well, that's when we're talking about pixel art. A raster is a rectangular pattern of parallel scan lines. If you know anything about what we're talking about pixel art, if you don't know about anything about old school TVs, we have scan lines, lines that the electron gun is scanning across and it's lighting up the little dots for us. 
Well, that's what we're talking about. The raster, it's an old, it's a word from, uh, I believe it's the 1930s and it's German. It just meant like a screen or a grid. And so that's all we're really talking about. It's a grid. So when we're talking about raster art versus vector art, raster art is like a bitmap or a JPEG. It has pixels in it. And the reason why we don't always like to use raster art in our graphics software or in our uh, production is because when we have a small raster, it only has the number of pixels it has. If we try and scale it up, we still only have that resolution. The number of pixels might change, but the individual squares, all they do is get bigger and it's more pixel, more individual dots that make up the squares that were already there. So if we have low resolution, it stays low and the quality is low. The edge quality stays the same no matter what. So when we're talking about these old school graphics, we're talking about retro game art. That is raster art. It's made up of dots on a grid, a rectangular grid of some kind. We know what pixels are. They're these individual dots that make the art up. And we know that if we're dealing with stuff like this retro video game art, there are some things that we can look for that kind of say, hey, this is what it is. These exemplify that video game art. And you know, that's something that I'll, I wanna talk about, right? We're, we look, we're looking at this, certainly, as you can see, I don't like that as much. And, but we look at pieces like this and it's, it's still pretty detailed, but we know that it's a fairly low resolution, right? We look at old school Mario here, the small one. As you can see, the texture is a little confusing. I think it looks better in the larger size. So we'll go take a look at the larger Mario. At this angle, the light may be a little confusing. I think this probably shows it the best. A lot of that's the hot flash they used in the commercial, uh, the commercial photography that was done for this piece. But what we can see is it's not a lot of dots. If we think about the source of this art, right? The source of this art is like 8-bit video game art. And 8-bit video game art had very, very low resolution. The entire screen, and this is this is pretty much, this is when we're dealing with TV of any kind, old school, low resolution, regular, you know, CRT TVs. We only had like 256 by 224, right? Now that's, in, in the US, it's different in the PAL regions. NTSC, that's what it is. We have this really small number of pixels, 256 pixels by 224 pixels to render the entire screen. So the whole screen and everything that's going on has to be rendered in those really tiny amount of pixels, something that we would never accept for art th these days. So we know part of what we're looking for as a quality we're trying to exemplify is actually this low resolution. We want to call that out. So we want jaggy edges. We want these big blocky pixels, right? And that's the thing. If you think about this, uh, small Mario, who's pictured here, 12 by 16 pixels on screen, 12 by 16 pixel brick. That's it. So 12 dots by 16 dots. That's what we have to make up Tiny Mario. That's all we have. Whereas we look at Sonic the Hedgehog, why are we seeing only uh, Sonic's face here, uh, especially as we're trying to do it large and get a lot of that texture on this hat? Well, uh, Sonic, so that's the Genesis 16-bit era, uh, Mega Drive for you people in the UK. Uh, essentially, small, or let's see, uh, Sonic is 40 by 63 in total. So way more pixels than Mario. So once we get to like the 16-bit art, you'll see that sometimes that 16-bit art is harder to shrink down for caps and especially for dad hats if you're doing this style because one of the things I'm gonna show you, as you've seen before here, uh, that these smaller pixels can be less dramatic when you're trying to get this cool basket weave effect. So doing really small pixels, number one, it's kind of a pain when you're digitizing it because each of these pixels is drawn individually or at least copy and pasted. Um, and there's some different shapes to each pixel because we're talking about, remember we talked about that earlier with the QR code that if something is overlapping, we wanna make sure that this pixel here gets underneath the other pixel that's going on top of it so that we don't have any breaks and it doesn't show color in between. So here we end up with the larger sprites that we have for, um, that we have for like the 16-bit era those sprites can sometimes be harder to render. So you'll see a lot of people are doing 8-bit stuff like Nintendo. Uh, early NES games, Zelda and Mario are super easy to do. And people are doing stuff in that nature where they only have that kind of 16 by 16 square that they're working in rather than, like I said, 40 by 60 feet for the entirety of Sonic the Hedgehog. If you know who Sonic is, this guy here, his whole body was 40 by 63. We actually have a question from Mike Muldowney here and I'll go ahead and bring it in. How tall is large Mario? You know what? I actually looked that up for this. Uh, large Mario is 16 by 32. <laughs> so there's large Mario still only 32 pixels, pixels high, which is about half the size of Sonic Sprite. So Sonic's resolution is about twice what Mario was, which is not surprising. Uh, but like I said, and, and also Mike says those hat designs look monstrous. Yeah, they are really huge. By the way, monstrous hat designs like this, these are done in a factory somewhere separate in panels. They're done panel program and panel program means 
previous to being sewn into the hat. The two front panels are sewn together and then the design is sewn onto them before it's put into the crown, before the buckram is there to stabilize it or crinoline, whatever they're using. So these are done on flats. And one of the reasons they look so great at this huge size way up into the curve is that these are done on flats. For us, we're gonna have to limit our vertical size we're working with sometimes, which is also why I'm gonna tell you guys when you are looking for your own art to do your art prep, let's start shifting toward us doing our own pixel art designs. You're going to wanna look for designs that are fewer pixels that are smaller. And I like to look for, if I'm looking for my own art or if I'm trying, either I'm trying to make my own art or I'm looking for art to use that I can do myself. I'm looking for 8-bit styled art. It's gonna have less color depth, which means we're not going to see as much shading. You'll see that actually in Sonic, we've got multiple blues here that are in the head. So it's very much more um, intense as to having to do all of the different patches of color. And uh, it also is going to have these larger pixels and I can do a large design that gives me that big blocky pixel that shows all of this shine and shadow from the different uh, stitch angles without having the bulk of the size. Because a lot of these are done on hats. I haven't seen these done as a big jacket back or anything, or even as left chest. Mostly these are hat front pieces that are done with pixel art. So like I said, I like to look for 8-bit styled art when we're gonna do it. And so why don't we go ahead and get into the article that I shared. And like I said, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the stuff that we had here. The original Tiny Mario that's here, um, not a bad piece. This is a commercially available piece that was out in the stores. I think it was stitched a little high if you want to, if you want to start criticizing. As we all do, I took a look at this hat and I took a look at it and measured things, took pictures, checked it out, flipped the inside and looked at the how the embroidery was done. There's nothing wrong with this rendition, but I think that at this size, the pixels are a little small and the texture gets lost. If you stand three to six feet away from this thing, you almost can't tell that that texture is there at all. It just looks a little shimmery. So for me, these are not exactly what I'm looking for. And if I were doing this myself, even do, doing this Mario piece, I think that the much larger rendering here is going to show that faceted look. It is like a faceted gem. As we know, if we look in this shoulder, and by the way, sorry guys, pointer focus for some reason is not working with StreamYard. I'm gonna see what I can do to render that so you can see my pointer better. But you can see the pointer here in this corner. Uh, uh, this shoulder here, this is all the same green. This pixel here, this pixel here, these are all the same green that's there. And yes, original Mario had green for that color. Um, these are all the same color, but we actually have these opposed 90 degrees. So one of, what's one of the things that we're looking for when we're creating this style? We're going to use satin stitches so we have the shine. We're going to use larger pixels if we want to get this to work. Um, the piece that I'm going to show you has pixels that are about 2.5 millimeters wide. And of course, because they end up square, they're 2.5 both directions when they finish. They're certainly not that when we have all the compensation and overlap in place. But that's what we're looking for. We have large pixels. And each pixel, they go in an opposing set where one will be at 90 degrees, one will be at zero degrees, and they will continue that across any field. And when we're looking at them as a field entirely, we always, always alternate on the same patterns. And that gives it a very regular look, but it does have the shine change dramatically from pixel to pixel. So that's these are the things we're looking for. Larger pixels, we like the large pixels if we want this look. We're looking for satin stitches opposed at 90 degree angles. And personally, I think that the most effective look for these personally has been 8-bit styled art or super low resolution art. And I would even consider, uh, like they showed, like I showed you with the Sonic example, that was only the head of a character, that was a portion of a character, and that might be an easy way to kind of get 16-bit art that looks very much like this where you get that style. So that's the texture we're looking for. And here's actually a test of me working on my own piece. And I'm gonna show you this piece in a second here. This was my piece, my classic piece here. Um, and we started with preparing our art. But as you can see, as it's on the machine, immediately upon starting this test, I can tell you that we got that look from what I was trying to do. It's not like it was incredibly hard to figure out. The difficulties really are in dealing with pull and push compensation because we always know that a big satin stitch is going to be very difficult to deal with. As we can see on the bottom edge here, when we have it unsupported, when there's no border around it, when there's nothing to identify that border or clean it up, you have an open face on the satin stitch and then you have the side of the satin stitch and we have those repeated over and over again. It's very easy for your edges to become uneven 
and it's very easy for your pixels not to end up square. So you may have to do some testing on the material that you want to run to make sure that you get the right pull compensation, the right push compensation to get those square pixels. But this bottom edge here that's on this image, and I'll show you the little image of, that we're working with, the character we're working with, that is hard to get straight if you don't carefully handle your preparation. You don't carefully handle your pull compensation, your push compensation. But the first thing we're going to say is I started out by preparing my art. So when I want to digitize a piece like this, let's just say I want to get some 8-bit uh, art. First thing I'm going to do is show you where I got my art. And this is a place called opengameart.org. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is because for my purposes, I didn't want to have anything that was commercially actionable. You know, guys, Nintendo can come get you. <laughs> Nintendo very recently has attacked all the ROM sites. If you don't know what a ROM is, it's a file that is the dumped uh, contents of a cartridge. A lot of people were emulating old systems and running them themselves and not purchasing cartridges, of course. You can't purchase them most of the time. But they were running these in their computers on these emulators. Um, those ROM sites were all shut down in the last couple of years because Nintendo started actioning on those. I'm not saying they're coming for people making pixel art hats in their backyards, but you may want to have art that is not this. Now, if you're making it for yourself, hey, go nuts, guys. I'm not going to tell you what to do. However, if you want some art that is open source that you can use, um, a lot of open game art does actually have some pixel style characters and does have them listed, or at least you can search by things that are 8-bit or 16-bit. And this is the one I chose. Um, I'm a fan of old school RPGs, role-playing games. And one of the base things in almost all RPGs is some sort of little slime character ever since like a uh, Dragon Warrior on the Nintendo. The basic guy, the first little monsters you fight to build yourself up are usually little slimes. And I love those little slimes. So for me, I wanted to have a little shiny slime character that I was going to be able to uh, work for this particular pixel art. And as you can see, the little blue slime up here is essentially what I did. And this is an animated version of this guy. Um, as you can see, animated is really cool. Little bouncing slimes are fun. But I went ahead and selected uh, this particular uh, still frame of this guy and blew it up. And as you can see, super small because these are done in the actual dot size. They're really teeny tiny. You can see that little animated resting slime there. Well, that's what I decided to do is use this piece. So these are incredibly small, small size on them. They don't have a lot of dots involved. And that's so that I could really focus on making a larger piece, even though I wanted it to be kind of a dad hat style design, a very small design. So as you can see, there's the body of that little slime character there. Also, not many colors. I only have, I've got uh, three blues and a white and a black. That's all I have for that. So that's really where I was looking to go. I wanted a very limited color palette so I could emphasize that kind of uh, old school color palette. If you look at like a Nintendo, Nintendo can only show 25 colors at once on screen and the 64 total on the entire machine, no matter what, it only had the capacity for that and generally was showing far fewer. So only a few colors is where I want to be. Plus it's going to simplify that design for me. And the first thing I'd like to say is you need to do some prep work to get these things right. The easiest way to handle these is to start and get your prep right first and make sure you've got your stuff aligned and everything's right. You know what's going on. The thing is when you first download art like this or when you draw art like this, generally you're not going to have pixel borderlines to help you figure things out. And if you're using a pixel size like I was two and a half millimeters, um, you can either set your grid on your software to that size and then align your image exactly to the grid. Or you can do uh, like I've done in my piece, and I'll show you this in a second. You can actually use your guidelines and snap a guideline on every one of the, the borders where these pixels will be. And I'll go ahead and show you that. Like I said, 16-bit art that has more pixels is going to be more labor. And it's going to be a lot more little squares to handle. And as you know, each square has to then have its overlaps handled and it has to have pull and push compensation, like I said. So I decided to go very simple. That's what a good starting project. And doing that with the grid also made it easier. But the first thing we're going to want to do is to take our art, whatever art that is, it's usually going to come in at a much smaller size than we want it. We're going to want to scale it so that the one square pixel is the size we want. For me, that was about two and a half millimeters. So this particular piece, I was scaling my art in graphic software. You can also do it in your embroidery software and measure. Uh, scaled my art ahead of time to make sure that each pixel was exactly 2.5 millimeters on a side because they don't, they can't be pixels in the art anymore. The original art would then only be 16, you know, pixels on a on a side, and that's going to be much too small to work on. I want it to be the finished size, of course, 
of my finished piece. So I made sure that my pixels were 2.5 mils on the side and I got that into the software. So once again, this is not gonna be automated and I'll show you what automation does to these things. Uh, this is going to be something we're going to handle ourselves and we know that we need to make each individual pixel one embroidery object. So before we go any further, we all know that because each one of these is a satin stitch, every square here is going to be an object that has been drawn drawn or copy and pasted. And believe me, once I got my elements put together, they were indeed copy and pasted. But the first thing is to get a properly sized piece and to get it aligned to a grid and have a grid in your software so you can see what you're doing. And I'll go ahead and pull software up so you can see that. Um, the initial pieces here, we'll go ahead and go over here to this pixel slime. We'll zoom out on the guy. But I actually went ahead and drew myself a grid so that I could work with it and adjust it. Uh, this is what I ended up doing. I actually drew a grid with guidelines and we can go ahead and take a look at it. I'll pull the stitches out of there so you can see it. Um, this grid with guidelines is done over the art. And actually you'll see just how compensated, if I zoom in on this, you'll see how compensated each one of these pixels is. As you can see here, this is a pixel where the stitches are going this direction. They're going vertically. You can see how this is how much I had to overshoot to get the pull comp right. And this is how much I had to chop back from the end to get the push compensation right for these to be square, right? But you can see the, the original art, if I don't have this here, if I pull this away, despite the fact that I've got the lines for this, let's say that I hide all of this stuff. Let's hide all of that. So we don't see any of the actual design portion. If we don't have that selected, right? You can see if I go ahead and let's bring just the art back. We'll unlock the art, but you can see how there is no line here now. There's nothing showing you where these pixels end and it's a lot easier if we have our grid where it belongs. So we're gonna go ahead and grab our little grid lines here and we're gonna make sure that those are at those pixel boundaries. Or like I said, you can see that I have an underlying grid here. If I wanted to, I could also have sized that grid in my software, uh, use whatever uh, preferences you have and size it to your pixels and then go ahead and handle that, right? Go ahead, handle it that way, align it to that grid that way. I found that it, that I really wanted to have something a little more bold so it was easier to see. And I didn't want to not have my original grid that shows me essentially what size things are on smaller scales because I was using that. I use that grid to help me keep focus on the sizing of my, um, of my compensation. Because as you guys may know, I do my compensation manually uh, first. I do my compensation manually first and then adjust with percentages and with other settings when I want to adjust it a little bit for materials or if there are issues. So in drawing my shapes, drawing my shapes out, as you can see, I've drawn them uh, in a rectangle rather than a square so that I can get that. I wanted to have my smaller uh, millimeter grid in the background so I could see about how much I was pulling in. It just helps me keep focus. That standard grid helps me keep focus. So instead of changing my uh, software grid, I went ahead and just added myself a guideline grid to help that go. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring in a comment here. Uh, hey Eric, if you change type or stitch direction, you get a different effect of the same color, it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what's being done here. So yeah, if, if you just showed up, we talked about that previously. These are all done in those same colors and I'll actually bring in pictures if I can here and we'll show you this actual piece. As soon as you start running it, all of this in here is that same light blue and we get that incredible change in stitch direction here. We have that horizontal versus the vertical and look how different those colors are. Same here, this is this line here is all that same blue and we get a very different look and that's on an off angle. When you get the lighting just right and as you turn, it really is like facets on a gem and you can see this is what we're talking about. We get these very different looks and this is a very flat angle, doesn't really show it. You don't get nearly as much as the off angle and it's still, you see how different those colors are with contrast, you get how different that looks. And then when you get off angle, look at how different the colors are just by changing those directions. So yes, Jamie, absolutely. Uh, if you change the type of the stitch, you can certainly get different textures, but the stitch direction here, just going that stitch direction, going 90 to zero over and over in that kind of basket weave pattern, absolutely gives you the same effect. This is only, like I said, there, there we have these different colors in blue. Here we are, we have it like that. We have that back here. We've got this blue, we've got the one dark blue, we've got this medium blue here. That's all we have. We're, this whole section in here, aside from the little tiny white highlight, this is all one blue and it looks very different. And as we move it through the light, it certainly changes that stuff. So this is certainly an interesting thing to try out. I think that it's really cool to see how those angles play into it. But let's go back into the art prep and stuff like that. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and as you can see, folks, when you first start, 
doing that initial prep is fairly important to get that done because we're going to have to digitize in such a way that it handles that. Once we're prepped and we're aligned, we know what we're looking for, we have the sizes set, and we know what we essentially have to do as, as, as well when it comes to overlap and underlay. We know that if something runs before something else, we want those statins to reach out underneath the part that's going to run next so that we don't get breaks. So when we digitize, you're going to see, certainly, you see the difference between the edges of the pixels, and that's also something that's gonna show you. We have this, that bottom line being straight, is only achieved if we shorten up on the push compensation. What I always call it is we wanna slow down, we wanna pull back before we get to the edge when we're in the flat, the open side of the satin stitch. And on the side of the satin stitch that pulls on the sides where the stitches pull together, we wanna to overshoot that border. And as you can see, here's our actual line that we wanna hit that's on the bottom here. The satins that go over it, they shoot past it a fair amount and the ones that are, are going to push down, they are stop early so that when they push, they reach that same line across the board. So we're going to have to test that. It depends on our material, depends on how much stress we stretch we have. It depends a little bit on the size of the piece. So what I would recommend is you use some standard size that you are aware of from using satin stitches and other work. And then once you get this thing all done, you'll see about where you are. You may find that you haven't compensated enough and then you can tweak it a little bit. But as I said previously, when I do this stuff, I do the initial compensation and overlap, I draw that into the initial elements. So once again, if we bring up software and I show you this piece, if you look at one of the, just one of the pieces that we have there, any one of these pieces is going to be drawn in a different, you know, in a different shape than what's supposed to be there, obviously. So when we look at this here, we have this piece here, Certainly you see that it goes underneath this other piece. Well, it doesn't reach underneath there. Why does it not reach under any further? Because we actually have this piece is already compensated and we know that this is going to push beyond the border. And in fact, the thing is the position of each pixel on the grid also changes part of it. So let's go ahead. This is one of my original, um, one of the original pieces doesn't have all the sequencing done correctly on this piece yet. But what you can see is because I have this edge here and you'll see my cursor moving up and down, we stop short toward the left edge because we know it's going to get longer in this direction. It's going to stretch out toward that open side. But when we see this on the other side, it doesn't stop short. Why does it not stop short here? Because we're going into the rest of the stitching happening here and we want it to push under because those pieces are going to run later. We want it to push under. We want it to go ahead and stretch in. So you'll see that even though I'm drawing these comp the compensation in, it depends on if I'm on an edge or not, or if I'm underneath another pixel or not, whether or not I'm going to cut back and leave it room to push out. So there is something more to it than just copying, pasting one pixel over and over. And especially because this particular piece, and I have got the one of the final versions of it here, it actually runs center out. Now this may not be my very final version. I had to get this prepped kind of last minute. And what I'll show you is just like any hat would do, this piece runs from the bottom center out as much as it can. And I'll show you how that works. See, here's our first vertical pixel. Then we have a horizontal pixel and you'll see that we have a little bit of room left. It does stretch underneath. Then we go back and do the next row and you'll see that compensation already showing up, right? There's that next row there. There's that piece. Then we go back around that piece. And par part of the thing you'll see is I have traveled under future pixels that are going to be fully covered because we do not need to jump here. This can all be one filament of thread. So we're gonna run under this piece. And as you can see, each one of these is a satin stitch that I have defined with four corners. So these are all being drawn in. You're, this is not being processed automatically. Then there's a little mouth, which is that darker blue. Also the shadow is in that darker blue. Once again, centered out, bottom up. Then we have the highlight colors, the medium blue for the shadow, bottom up again and up to the top here. We now have the final outer shadow and we have the eyes. So as we did this, as much as we could, you can see centered out, bottom up, and you can see how those stitches reach under future pixels that are going to be put under there so that we don't get breaks. You have to pre-compensate. Like I said, what I like to do, I draw the square as a rectangle, making sure that I give extra room in the pull dimension less in the push dimension. And then when I change my materials or find that I'm a little off and it's universally off by an amount, I can go in and set my pull compensation to however many points I need to get that amount where I need it overall, 
or in specific areas. And I can do small adjustments with numbers, with settings, with parameters, but the drawing is where it all starts. So we'll go ahead and run through that again. And I'll show you that is the little pixel slime guy in a nutshell, right? And I can see uh, Tom Farr of Buzzards Bay Embroidery is in, and he said, said he tested this as a 3D logo. I would love to see uh, 3D versions of these logos and stuff if you'd like to. So, you know, really love to see more of this kind of experimentation, but that's the essence of it. So when we're talking about what we need to look out for for this stuff, we can kind of discuss very simply what the characteristics are, right? Ultimately, just like I always say, this is only made up of a very simple stitch type. This can be done in any software. It is not something that needs an automatic process, but it is something that takes a lot of manual work if you want it to turn out right. The thing is, essentially, we only have to look at the essence of what we are trying to achieve, which is the pixel art. What does pixel art look like? It is chunky. It is low resolution. It usually has a low color depth, very few colors. If we're trying to get that texture, we want to make sure that we're alternating our stitch angles and we want big satin stitch pixels. So once we have that, that's the style that's easy to do, then the technicality of the thing really is choosing the right art, making sure you have art that's going to work for the size that it needs to work. You're going to have those big pixels so you don't get those little tiny kind of sparkle effects instead of having the big chunky facets that we're looking for for that kind of basket weave look. So we choose the right art, we get it sized correctly, we align it to some kind of grid. You can draw your own grid or use the grid in your software to do it. Either way is fine, but we're going to want a grid so that we can split up the art into those rows, into that raster, so that we can see where each pixel boundary should end up. Because that's the thing. Even in here, we're not going to be drawing to the boundaries. As you can see, I'm drawing past the boundary. You talked about this a million times. We are going to be drawing those lines outside of the boundaries. The thing is, we need to know where those boundaries are so we know if we have enough pull compensation, enough push compensation, and it lets us kind of just have a good track, have a map to where those should end up. So we align it to a grid at size, and then it's down to just drawing little satin stitch pixels and making sure they're compensated. That's really the essence of the thing. So in doing this pixel art, I would actually say this is not a very difficult piece. It's not that hard. Mostly it's about remembering where we are in the art. It's about counting correctly. It's about making sure that you can get that overlap where it's supposed to be. So you want to make sure that any pixel, when it's next to another pixel, if it runs before the others, that it reaches underneath the boundaries of the other pixels a little bit so that we can make sure we have full, complete coverage. And that's about it. It really is an exercise in controlling the satin stitch as much as you can. So when I'm looking at these pieces, really, it's not much different from doing any other kind of satin stitch art. It's not that different from digitizing fonts. It's not that different from what, what do we deal with when we're dealing with fonts? Well, we deal with the fact that the baseline looks jagged on our, pic, on our actual on-screen look. Why does it look that way? The bottom of a T has to be stopped short and the bottom of an E, the crossbar in the bottom of the E has to be extra wide underneath the perceived baseline. The baseline we want to hit, the bottom of the T, that column is going to push down and the bottom of the E is going to pull up. And eventually we want to arrive at that baseline. It's the same thing with the pixels, but writ large, each pixel needs to arrive. The edges that are visible that are on top should arrive at the boundaries that are set on that grid. That's really what we're looking to do and that's the issue. This thing looks really outside of scale, right? <laughs> this thing looks really kind of crazy and outside of scale. It doesn't look like it's going to end up the way that we know it's going to end up. We have these pixels that look crazy. The bottom edge looks heavy. Each of these pixels looks funny. The little eyes look sleepy because they're kind of short and squat. But what we know, and, and look, the mouth looks super uneven. But what we know is that this pixel is going to get taller. The mouth pixel on the left is going to get taller and the one on the right is going to get shorter because of the angle of the stitches. And if we compensate correctly, we can arrive where those angles arrive at the edges where we want them to be. So that's really kind of the way we're looking at it. And when we look at the final piece, as you can see, that mouth is even across the sides. The bottom edge is fairly even. There's a little bit of variation there, but the bottom edge is pretty even. And what we're essentially finding out is that when we do the compensation correctly, and this is how wild that compensation looks like on screen, the actual piece will end up with straight lines. And as you can see, we have a grid that's visible across the entire piece because that's what we're trying to get at. 
can we do it without that grid? You absolutely can just make pixel styled art that is fully filled and not worry about the grid. This particular style, this textural style is here because people want to call out the grid-like nature of this art. So that's what we're looking at here. We're trying to arrive at the grid. So really all we're doing is looking at what we're trying to do to get that grid to work. And essentially that's it. We just wanna make sure that we get our compensation worked out. We wanna make sure that we have everything aligned on the grid in our art, and we're going to end up with this kind of look in the end. That's our end game is to end up with this shine. So what are the essential things we've learned about over and over and over that play into this? Number one, stitch angle and the sheen of the thread comes together to give you shine and shadow that helps define texture in your piece. When we talk about digitizing any other way, like let's talk about animal fur, we talk about something organic and we say, okay, we use irregular patterns to give you something organic, even when we have shiny thread, we'll use uh, randomness in the stitch penetrations on a fill stitch to give you that sort of organic look. Well, here we want something that's very much not organic. It's technological. It is not supposed to be organic at all. It is shiny. It is regular. It is rectilinear. It is made of squares. So what do we do? Very regular positioning, very regular grid, right? But that's the thing. This is all texture. If you do it in just a fill, Yes, the fill is interesting. It's not bad. It's not the worst thing you've ever seen. But the look of that fill is certainly not as captivating, as interesting, as high quality as this look is, in my opinion. And, and especially if you're looking to do something different. Everybody has seen an image rendered as a slab of fill. They may not have seen an image rendered in these individual shiny pixels. And this plays into other styles. Like I said, I showed you guys the QR code. If, I mean, certainly there's the cross-stitch stuff, but there's also the QR code. This QR code is also based in that same kind of look. Now, certainly this is also technical. I'm trying to arrive at squares that are the right size and right spacing from each other because otherwise the QR code won't work, <laughs> right? It won't scan. But the same thing is true. I'm looking at the control of a satin stitch's width and height through pull compensation, push compensation. That's what we're looking at. That's all we have to do to get this right. And like I said, I think that when we achieve it correctly, it looks a lot better. Here's something I showed somebody. Somebody else said, oh, why don't I just auto digitize it? And simple designs work with auto digitizing look great. Um, here is an auto digitized version of that same art. Now, one of the eyes disappeared. I can give it the benefit of the doubt and say, maybe the eye would have worked if I would have tweaked the auto. But this is the automatic version of this thing. So if we're looking at this piece, now I don't even have to run it for you to show. Now, certainly the other thing to look at as we scroll this, you can see that we don't have the right compensation and certainly we're going to get gaps all up and down this thing. I'll say that, let's say even if you adjust all the compensation or overlaps are right, this is the texture you're looking at here versus this. Which one of these do you think is going to capture someone's eye when they're looking at it? Which one says this is interesting, this is going to have some sort of uh, delight, this is something interesting I wanna show somebody? And also which one in movement do you think is gonna be more interesting? Certainly the one with all the little facets, this little guy's gonna be more interesting by far than this automated version, this fill version. And so I think it is worthwhile, but what I'm gonna tell you is this takes absolutely no time. The auto version takes very little time. And even if you drew it by yourself, it's only the points on the corner you have to handle. Uh, this little guy takes more time. However, once you know that I have, like let's say this pixel here, this pixel is going to be on top of the pixel to the left and under the pixel on the right. And it's this orientation. I know that this pixel here is the same as one two over as long as I'm going in the same direction. These two pixels are exactly the same. And this third pixel is exactly the same. These pixels are all the same. So I can copy and paste and I can take little groups of two pixels and copy and paste. And I can copy and paste those once I have my compensation right. The only thing you have to know is it's not just one pixel because you have to know uh, where there are pixels that are going to run on top of it because we want to make sure we extend underneath them. And if we have an edge, we want to know uh, what we're trying to arrive at uh, at the edge. We have to make sure that that edge is straight so those are compensated. So the pixels on the opposite, on the edge here might be a little different depending on where they land. And because I've centered this out right and left, because of that direction of travel, apparent travel in the design, it'll change which side is compensated. So you can copy and paste, but you will be doing careful positioning of each row and each pixel. 
and working with the fact that you've got multiple different colors here and that, that you will have to then deal with the different colors of pixels and trying to connect them. Because as you know, if, especially if you're working with me, um, invariably I'm looking for the most efficient path through something. This particular piece uh, only trims I believe the last like three pixels here, the two pixels of the eye have a trim between them. And there's one pixel that I could not attach to anything without leaving a line in the shadow. Otherwise, every color has zero trims. Each color travels through everything and does not have any trimming in it. There's only the trims between the eyes, one pixel here, and the beginning and end of each color uh, in the colorway. So for efficiency's sake, I probably did more work than somebody might do if they don't care if they get to an end, or, end of the row and they just want to jump all over the place. You can do that and let your machine trim it. For me, there was a little more work involved in how I did the sequencing because I sequenced it to be the most efficient I could do if I did this as a production run of hundreds or thousands of these caps. And that's just kind of how I work. Not necessarily what you have to do. What you do have to do is make sure you understand how the overlapping works because the overlapping is going to show that texture and give you that final grid. So, so I know that sounded a little technical. There was a lot going on there, but really it's simple and it's essential. It's why I always say that if we learn the basic stitch types, the basic conglomerations of that only one stitch that we have, if we learn pull compensation, push compensation, if we understand texture, sheen, of thread, we understand the shine and shadow, and we understand stitch angles, then everything else we do will naturally come from that understanding. Understanding the elements of embroidery kind of atomically, basically, essentially, will give us everything we need to do more interesting styles. So here's a style that is not something we've thought of previously. It's not something that appeared as an automatic setting anywhere. And honestly, I had not seen a texture like this until this stuff started becoming popular, even though I did some very similar stuff. Like I said, I originally tried to do some stuff where we had pixel-like textures, but even I only went with bars of satin stitch, not really contemplating the idea of this grid until I actually saw somebody else do it. And I'll say, I, I looked at somebody else's samples to do it. But I think overall that it was, was particularly, I, I think it turned out very well. And I think that this is successful. I mean, all of these things kind of lead up to the final end where we get pieces like this. And certainly I was fairly happy with my little slime guy. Little pixel slime turned out well. I think I could have chosen something that had a little more definition to the character. A little blob of uh, blue slime might not be the most uh, articulated thing. At least Mario here has some arms and legs. But I do think that it turned out well and that style is accessible to everybody as long as they understand kind of what we're working with in that nature. So with that guys, I think I'm gonna go ahead and round this up. I don't think we have anything else we really need to talk about aside from saying, I would love for you guys to try this out. Um, I don't have this available on my website. I may put this on the website later. If I do, I'll go ahead and link it on this particular video and this page, either on YouTube in the description or on Facebook. But currently I don't believe I have this available for everybody. Um, but this is a piece that I think that you can do yourself. Even if you just put a row of satin stitches blocked out like this and make a little checkerboard, I think it's worthwhile to take a look at that in a single color thread and see what kind of uh, effects you get from the different angles of thread. I think it's actually a very interesting basic project and isn't actually all that difficult to achieve if you work on it. Um, but let's go ahead and drop in a couple more comments before I finish out. And I actually have something else to share with you guys that I think I'd love for you to take a look at if you, can, if you do want to take a look. I've actually got another appearance if you are not tired of hearing me today, or if you want to hear something else from me later, talking about e-commerce patches and other stuff, I actually have another podcast appearance I did recently that might be of interest to you. But first, let's get a couple more comments that are here. Um, we have Lisa Shaw joining in, Lisa Shaw of Imbrilliance and uh, of her own Sew Bubbles channel, who does awesome education, mostly on the home side, but her home craft stuff is awesome. And honestly, no different. She's someone who digitizes. She's a digitizer. She knows what she's doing and teaches awesome stuff. Uh, she says, good afternoon. Uh, this style of faux smocking would be a hybrid of this maybe. Uh, yeah, the little kind of checkerboard patterns in smocking that you see would be something you would do the same thing. All, all we're really talking about is Satin stitches. These are small blocks of satin stitches. And as we know, if we're looking at a satin stitch that we want to be square, right? We want to get a square. Well, if our angle is horizontal on a satin stitch, we want it to be square. We know that it needs to be wider and shorter because it's going to pull in in the angle of the stitch. It's going to pull in and it's going to stretch up. As we stack stitches on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other, they're going to push to the top and bottom. If we control push and pull, if we can make one square out of our satin stitches, we'll understand what we're looking for in our 
satin compensation for anything. Now that could be a checkerboard smocking style. This could be um, <laughs> this could be a pixel art piece of a little slime. It could be a little wizard. It could be Mario. It doesn't matter. What we're talking about is controlling the dimensions of a satin stitch column. So in controlling the dimensions of a satin stitch column, well, all we need to do is be able to set our pull compensation so that it is the width we expect it to be instead of the width that's on screen. And then our push compensation, we stop our edges. Either we draw or we use push compensation. If software has it, Stitch Artist does, not many do. Um, we can actually stop a certain number of rows of thread before we get to the ends of our satin stitch so that when it grows, that it ends up at the size we want it to. Once we can do that, then we know that we can arrive at any edge point we want. And when we're looking at something like this, we just want to make sure that we define that grid and say, okay, I want this pixel here, this square. I want this edge to be right here. So I know that I'm going to have to stretch out beyond it if we're in this direction, or if I'm my stitches are in this direction, I have to stop early so that when they grow, they grow out toward that line. And smocking the same way. Smocking has big empty areas, but that smocking style, that checkerboard style with the empty areas, same thing. We're going to have to control. The other thing you're going to have is let's say we have a checkerboard. Let's say we have a square here and a square here. I know I like to talk my hands a lot, guys. Let's say a square here and a square here. We're going to have to overlap because as we know, these are both going to pull. If this line is a perfectly matched and they start to pull, they're going to pull apart. We're going to get a gap. Even in the checkerboard, the corners won't touch. What are we going to have to do? Compensate so that when they pull, that line shows up exactly. So smocking, yes. Same kind of thing. We're just talking about controlling the satin stitch. That's all we're doing. So with that, guys, let's go ahead and finish up. I'm going to go ahead and show you really quickly what I was talking about as far as my podcast appearance. Jeff says, I'm looking forward to hear about the podcast appearance. The education you put out is amazing. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate it. You're putting out a lot of great education too. Everybody should be checking out MNerd if they're not checking it out now. Uh, but this is the thing I was talking about. And I'll go ahead and bring it up. Uh, if you guys don't know, I have written for many years for uh, the Printware Magazine, which then became Graphics Pro. Now they certainly cut back in their number of uh, articles per month. So I am not in every Graphics Pro anymore, but I do still appear in Graphics Pro. And uh, from what I hear, should be appearing a little bit more next year. We'll see what happens. Magazines are suffering as our uh, trade shows this year. So we're going to see some of my stuff. Uh, like I said, if you're used to seeing me live at trade shows, you may not see me. What is really great though, is if you haven't gotten a chance to see me live, there will be way more options to see me online. If you don't live in trade show states or can't travel uh, in general, before everything happened, you will have much more chance to get stuff that I only taught at trade shows taught via the internet and get all those assets yourself there. However, one of the cool things that came out of Graphics Pro uh, recently is they started a podcast uh, not too long ago. They're on episode 12 now, so they're starting to get going. And I had a really great time uh, talking about patches and gradients and e-commerce and embroidery in general. Now we talked for a really long time. They cut it down to about 17 minutes. So it's a lot shorter. It's not even bonus time for the take up. Uh, but <laughs> suffice it to say, um, this is one of those things that I think would be pretty interesting folks. And I think that's, uh, so I would like for you to check out if you have a chance to look at it, it is the graphics profiles. Um, and pro graphics pro profile is kind of cool. And this in this piece, I got to really kind of share, share my love of embroidery and discuss that stuff. I'm going to go ahead and bring this up. Hopefully it doesn't play automatically because I've realized that I still have some sound issues that were going on. We'll go ahead and see if I can't uh, stop my sound before you guys end up hearing me in stereo here. But this is where it is, graphicspro.com. I will go ahead and grab this link and dump it immediately right now in the comments if you want to check it out. And I'll go ahead and get that into the uh, description on YouTube if you're a YouTube watcher. But you can check this out right now over at Graphics Pro, and you'll see that uh, essentially we just got to chat about embroidery. They used an old stock image of me uh, looking a little less gray in the beard um, from my time as an in-house digitizer. And we got to really just get into patches, into talking about gradients, into talking about embroidery and what's important about it and how to do it. And, uh, had a great conversation. So audio only, if it's something where you're, uh, like Cindy here, who is, uh, off sewing her eyeballs out, <laughs> uh, you might go ahead and grab this podcast and you can listen to it. There's also a ton of other great people, uh, in their collection of the graphics pro profiles. Um, so definitely go check that out over at graphicspro.com. Uh, there's also some content from me there. If you search for embroidery topics up here in the search bar, you'll find other content from me as well, both before and me with, uh, you'll see me in my glory as I am here in the Embrilliant Studios rather than, <laughs> than the uh, old stock uh, image they used of me from previously. However, I think it was a good podcast and it's pretty cool stuff. And I'll actually, I'll go ahead and make another plug here. 
Cindy says, she came across a show I did on Madeira USA. Yeah, actually, if you go to the Madeira USA um, YouTube channel, you're going to see several shows that I did. I did one on 3D foam. I did one on tiny text. I've done them on cap design. Um, I did lots of webinars for Madeira USA. We haven't done any this year. Uh, something we're working on. I got an email from the folks over there recently, so we may have to see if there's something else we can work on. But you will definitely see some stuff from uh, me over at the Madeira USA uh, area. And what I'm going to tell you guys is, if you want to see me somewhere, like let's say Graphics Pro is the magazine you like to use, work with, uh, Impressions Magazine is what you like to go on, go ahead and shoot them an email. I work with anybody. I write for lots of magazines. I've written for images for a long time. I wrote for the predecessor to Graphics Pro. If there's something you want, you want Madeira USA to do more webinars with me, let them know because they already know me and we can always work something out. I love to do content for everybody. It's just more chances that I get to talk about embroidery, educate, and find people like you awesome reciprocators out there who like to work, like to listen, learn, experiment, develop new stuff, and give back. And that's what I am hoping for. So here's hoping this episode was a treat. I know there was a lot of like, there's some technical talk in there. And that honestly, when we're talking about pixel art, that pixel art is really all about satin stitches and isn't necessarily the most complicated thing ever. So I know maybe not the most technical thing. And we talked a lot to get to the point of, hey, control your pull and push compensation. But hopefully we've got a few things that you might take away from it. I'll go one more time over the last little bit of technicality that you might want to learn. And these are just my opinions. In doing this art, my most effective way to get this style was to use larger pixels, fewer colors, uh, eight bit art that had fewer pixels so I can get larger pixels in a smaller area. And for me, the pixel size I used in the example was 2.5 millimeters. You can go bigger or smaller, but that the smaller one looked a little bit more like it was twinkling where the larger one was chunky and showed those big pixel borders. So we're trying to get that grid. So manage your pull and push compensation, use those big large satin stitches, and make sure you think about where those ends will pull in, push out, and make your grid happen. Size your art, put it on a grid, and work that compensation, folks. Uh, with that, that will be the end of this take-up. I hope you guys have a happy Halloween, and I cannot wait to see you again.